We have been working with um, many uh, developers, uh, landscapers, landscape architects on how we can design and manage communities to conserve biodiversity. Hey everybody, I'm Candace Shively with Utah State University Extension and the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping, and you are watching our Water Well with Sea Well webinar series. Hello everyone, virtually. Um, I'm here on my back porch uh, at the university, near the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. Um, and I was telling Candace, I've been working quite a bit here, kind of working at home. And I've been friends with the Pileata Woodpecker. So if you hear a big call during our presentation, don't be alarmed, that's the, my buddy out there. Um, to give you a more background about my, our, myself and our program, uh, we formed sort of a consulting team in the University of Florida called the Program for Resource Efficient Communities. And we have been working with um, many uh, developers, uh, landscapers, landscape architects on how we can design and manage communities to conserve biodiversity and water and energy, etc. So when I, we've been doing this, um, for about oh, 20 years now. And as a wildlife biologist, I'm actually uh, work with birds and insects. I've always come across uh, landscaping parameters in terms of landscape architects seeing, saying, um, well, we can only go so far. We, we have to pay attention to cultural and societal uh, values about what's an appropriate landscape. And so diving into the literature a while back, I started to ask him, well, what, how can we um, uh, convince or at least educate homeowners to shift to more eco-friendly landscapes? And doing that, I came across a body of literature called Cues to Care. And after reading that about it and talking about it for the last five to 10 years, I, I wrote a, uh, a perspective essay in uh, urban ecosystems. And this kind of is a review of that literature and what it means and how it's been measured and how we will go forward to create more eco-friendly landscapes. Okay, so Candace, can you break in? You can see my screen okay? Yep, that looks great. Okay. So when we're talking about eco-friendly landscapes, um, I'm gonna break up into um, three sections. One, I just kind of give a brief overview, overview about yards, homeowner decisions and impacts. Then talk a little bit about the cues to care theory and has it been measured correctly? And then uh, discussion for a way forward. And then we're gonna have time for questions. I, I estimate this about a 20 minute presentation. So here's a kind of a cartoon character. If you think about homeowners, this is in Arizona. Um, and the uh, uh, person on the left has decided to do turf grass with a lot of water and irrigation versus the person on the right has done more saguaros and xeriscaping. So you can think about those decisions are made by societal norms, made by individual values, et cetera. Um, but you can imagine if, if cumulatively, if across the whole neighborhood, everyone did what the person on the right did, uh, the little greenie with the green shirt, um, you could have quite an impact on water, on energy, on biodiversity. But before they even make those decisions, there are some constraints. And this comes from a book that I wrote oh, about five, six years ago, um, a primer for conserving biodiversity and subdivision development. And the idea is that the developer has set sort of the norm for the community. It's just, they've decided how big the roads are, how um, much turf grass to use, or how much exotics versus natives. And so when people move into the community, even if they want to change it, change their yard, there is this subjective norm, this norm that's going to constrain. 
So we have to think about those different levels. That book goes in much more detail. I'm not going to uh, spend any more time on that, but just to let you know that even if a homeowner wants to change, there are some uh, constraints, even on up to the city or county level. We need to talk about regulations. So what we're talking about is how do we shift from conventional yards? Conventional yards are typically dominated by turf grass, lots of irrigation and fertilization, um, a lot of exotic plants, not much vertical height structure. As an ecologist, we're talking when you look across the landscape, the amount of vegetation from the ground up to the canopy. And there's a lot of the use of uh, sterile fill dirt, which has issues with keeping landscaping going over time. More alternative natural yards tend to have very little turf grass, very little, if not no irrigation fertilization. They're dominated by native plants, have vertical height structure, and they usually retain some of the original soil structure. So how can we shift that that little, if you think of that continuum, you can probably place yourself somewhere into the full bore wild versus the full conventional. Most people are somewhere in between there. But how can we shift that median uh, more towards natural? And why is that important? Well, as, as an urban ecologist, um, birds are uh, urban landscapes, neighborhoods, even small forest parks are used by over 240 birds in North America. And Candace, if you can put that um, web link into the uh, the chat, um, this is the URL. It's a it's a planning tool, so it's the first time the empirical research has been synthesized, so that uh, landscapers planners can manipulate their landscaping plans across the neighborhood to see how it impacts different species. Um, and that tool's been out for a while. And if you're interested in using it, just go to that URL. It's free and you can enter a design for, let's say for a section of a city or for a neighborhood and you can see how it impacts bird habitat. But people are a little resistant. I mean, uh, you know, just letting what I call lazy lawnmower approach, letting uh, their herbs come up and flower can get um, uh, some comments from your neighbors. So uh, how do we, create a more of a norm of uh, tolerance for more ecological friendly yards. So how do we overcome this conventional inertia? Well, INSTEP uh, years ago, uh, it was coined by a professor, jo Joan Nassauer. She's up at University of Minnesota right now. And what she thought, if we're gonna shift conventional to more natural landscape, we have to pay attention to cues in the landscape that show it's being cared for. So in a nutshell, how far will homeowners go to adopt more natural landscapes? Well, they have to answer the question, does it look like they're taking care of it? And when you ask about, are they taking care of it? I mean, how many cues are needed and what types of cues? So what is acceptable? So for example, uh, you can have a trimmed hedge, a bird feeder, 20% mowed lawn. Is that the expected ingredients? What well, makes a yard aesthetically attractive and at the same time ecologically functional, at least more functional than it was before? And there are all kinds of yards. These are yards in Gainesville, um, some of them more natural, um, some of them more conventional. You can imagine that range of yards all across um, where uh, you live too, and in some places maybe the more natural wild landscapes is accepted, and in other places they're not. So with this theory, um, Joan Nassar and her students and her colleagues, they've been studying um, homeowners from different cities. So they surveyed homeowners from different cities they showed yards with varying degrees of vegetation structure from mainly mowed to more wild. And then they asked participants uh, when they thought the yard was messy or too messy. And that kind of give an uh, indication that uh, what, how much cues are needed in the landscape. Now, when I was looking through these studies, I realized, uh, and there's a citation there if you're interested, um, uh, cues to care future directions for ecological landscapes and urban ecosystems right now. Um, that they were 
flawed on a number of levels. One is that a lot of the surveys were not a random sample, so you didn't really know if you were capturing all the opinions within a particular neighborhood. Um, sometimes the responses were really low, so there's something in survey lit literature design studies response bias that wasn't accounted for. Um, and the most important thing is that they only reflect the opinions of people in each particular neighborhoods in each city. So um, many of these individual homeowners were drawn from neighborhoods with landscapes that had highly manicured lawns. So the subjective norm was already for a high amount of mowed lawn. So anything that shifted that a little bit, people said it was too messy. But in terms of the application of it, unfortunately, I think a lot of um, talking anecdotally with landscape architects, they use these studies to say, well, we need certain cues. And when they go to those cues, they say things, well, when you do a landscaping practice, mown yards should cover at least half the front yard. And that came from one particular study that Nassau had done uh, with their students. Now, I'm not saying that all landscape architects are interpreting it that way, um, but there is this sort of assumption that these studies represent a general aesthetic view for all United States homeowners, when in fact, because of the flaws I just indicated, it may not actually reflect that. So what are the next steps? Uh, well, we do need, if anybody's out there, need well-designed studies that are random, uh, they address different cultures, different cities, different neighborhoods. Um, most of these studies were done in the Midwest, by the way. Uh, and the research should clearly state to design professionals um, that there are constraints to the study. In other words, if I'm surveying homeowners that have traditional 80% um, of the front yard mode, we have to really understand that that is creating a, a different norm than if you went to an older residential neighborhood that only had 20% mowed yards. And it kind of begs how flexible are people, even the people with those uh, highly um, constrained with subjective norms in their neighborhood, would their preferences change if through extension or through education, um, you told about the impacts of water, climate change, and wildlife. And there is some research out there. If you email me, I can send you a couple citations that says, yes, the education can shift those attitudes in terms of what they prefer for a yard. And imagine doing that same survey about the cues to care um, for people that moved into a neighborhood that had more natural yards. Would their preferences shift? And what if they grew up in a neighborhood with very little lawn? So there's all these conditions that set the stage for what people adopt when they actually manage their landscapes. So, not the whole nine yards. So you could imagine on that continuum doing, letting everything go and succession happen and the whole yard, a whole yard turns into a, a more natural area. Um, but what we found working with neighborhoods and people over the past 20 years is that you can have portions of the yard rewild, not the whole yard, just like a, a corner or a corner of a backyard. And you trim and you border these with trim bushes or stones, i.e. some cues that the landscape is being maintained. I also advocate what's called the lazy lawnmower approach. So yeah, you do going to mow portions of the landscape. Well, let the let it get a little tall, let the flowers come out. It really helps pollinators and then mow it down. Instead of doing it every week and a half, do it every three weeks. And I'm a firm believer that we need more model yards to uh, show these examples across different neighborhoods. Um, working with developers and planners and individual homeowners, it really took that maverick, that first step to do something a little bit different. And then that shifted just a little bit, the neighbor next door started doing something different and people were talking to him, to that person saying, hey, what are you doing in your yard? And when you do these different wild areas and yards, whether you do it at the offset or you do it um, uh, kind of like a retrofit, it really is important to get that first person to try something different. 
So in summary, uh, this is a funny photo. This is um, uh, Dr. Ray Carthy. He's known about this photo for years. I say, how do you reach a typical Florida homeowner, you know, that has a pool and the barbecue and the lawn in the back? So I do agree with the cues to care um, theory that you, if you're going to have more natural landscapes, you can't, you can't do it in a vacuum. You have to pay attention to cultural, economic, and societal social values. But we do need better research to see what cues are really needed. How much, I mean, can we do those little pocket of wild things with a little trim bush around there and, and it's accepted from one neighborhood to the next? And how can we uh, communicate environmental benefits and uh, across different neighborhoods, across different yards and how they uh, influence uh, yard preferences? So for example, one study had shown that just by uh, initial surveys and then taking them through um, extension education, um, training, then their attitude shifted in terms of what preferences they had uh, for their yard maintenance. And lastly, I think creating those model landscapes, I can't say how important that is um, from a developer putting it into their sales home to um, a neighborhood with the homeowner association and working through the homeowner association to have a couple neighbors to do those little wild pockets or pollinator gardens that really pays dividends to influence people throughout the neighborhood. If you wanna learn more about our group, um, it's a program for resource efficient communities. I'm in the Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation. Um, uh, Candace, uh, if you could put that uh, I'll put it in the chat room, the buildgreen.ufl.edu, and there is my email address if anybody would like to um, contact me after this presentation.